Why is a gentleman wet your tail? Drive on the plastic! The broadcast for all the bitch are all we're dozy. That's right, I'm here with Nigel today. And I'm joined by Thornberry. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of a British name on the spot. <laughs> I just regressed in my childhood cartoons. Thornberry. <laughs> How are you doing today, John? I'm doing a lot better now that we started that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good that's a good way to start the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. My my drive up this morning, it's negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit outside with wind chill. Yes, yes. Wind chill, negative like 15, negative 12, otherwise very fucking cold. Super. Yeah. Super cold. Yeah. Yeah. I in a video I did with the the Goobs collaboration in the beginning of it, I said I Goobs you know, he traveled to the Great White North, and I got a lot of um actuallys in the comment oh, section of the video. Dude. You're not the Great White North. I'm like, bitch, it's negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now. That's my D. Yeah, so to all you Canadians who are like, it's not cold in Minnesota. Minnesota, actually Minneapolis, is at the same, I can't remember if it's longitude or latitude. Um, the same, like, latitude. distance from the equator. Um as most cities in Canada, like uh, in you know Toronto and other places, the, with the one exception being, of course, Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. So, Jeremy, yeah, you, know, you have the bragging rights of being the coldest place, or one of the coldest places, also like Russia. Um, but <laughs> Canada is pretty much the same. Yeah, it's cold. We're not saying we're more cold. We're saying it's. You get to a point where it's cold enough where it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, <laughs> it's like living here is pretty miserable. Let us brag about this, please. It's, the, it's our one thing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's our one thing. <laughs> Let us have this. So we got some uh, we got some preamble ramble to talk about today. We do. Um, and uh, just before we started recording, we started talking a little bit about some of this stuff about uh, the expenses that go along with film and uh, all your rigs to do this kind of stuff. Oh yeah, just camera gear in general. Yeah. Oh, in our hobby is expensive. The miniature hobby is like golfing for nerds, right? It's super expensive. It's kind of uh, super expensive. I guess, you know, it's all relative, right? Right, right, right. It's a, an expensive hobby. Um, and I was like, when I started miniature painting, I was like, geez, it's like 30 bucks for this one miniature. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, Scott, I'm going to start doing some YouTube stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> They had a yeah. couple of zeros on everything you buy. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So I spent five grand this week. Whoa! What the fuck did you buy? <laughs> Two what? lights? Uh, no, I only bought one light. What did you buy? <laughs> Don't worry about it. I bought, may have bought a very expensive chair. Oh, yeah, dude. I've been sleeping on chairs, man. I th When I was going through checkout, I'm like, Dude, Scotty needs in on this. I do. So did you get like a gamer chair or did you get like a legit like nice office chair? Okay. I started off by doing a lot of research on what's the difference between the two. Okay. And there's some really good articles out there on there really isn't a difference. Oh. A high-end gamer chair. And we're not talking about the ones that just... A lot of them kind of look the same. Yeah. They got to look. But behind the scenes... There is a, a vast difference. Interesting. You know, not uh, not to be, not vast deferons, but vast difference. <laughs> it's a it's a pee joke. So, best um, <laughs> when you have to explain it. <laughs> um, but behind the scenes, there's really not a whole lot of difference if you go to the high end. So if you go like the the twelve hundred dollar office chair or the thousand dollar gaming chair, they're really accomplishing the same thing. Okay. Um, so it's just a matter of what features and look you want so i went with the gaming chair what brand um shoot what's it called the one you see advertisements for all the time uh there are a couple i feel like instagram knows what i yeah now it knows, knows what, what i, I look want. like so now it's probably not the only one i'll i'll uh i'll find it and i'll send a link over so you guys can take a look looky looky loo but i got like this carbon black like understated one i know cool. one just like super bright red with a horn <laughs> symbol in the yeah. middle racing stripes <laughs> wah, wah, wah. it's got a bullhorn built into the chair so you can just <laughs> smack it no i didn't get like the mr beast special or anything yeah. <laughs> speaking of mr beast when i was watching the super bowl uh last weekend 
there was a shot of the crowd and so there was like 25,000 people in the crowd but then there was also like 35,000 cardboard cutouts so yes. it like the whole thing was filled yeah did you see this they did a shot to the crowd and there was a cardboard cutout of Mr. Beast oh yeah just sitting there like this like completely understated like if you knew you knew if you yeah. didn't you'd be like who is that who weirdo is that? yeah yeah um so that's interesting did people have to pay for those I th- well at some points like for the Packers because I'm a Packers fan oh uh, uh you could um basically you would buy a cardboard cutout of yourself and you'd you know, send in your picture and they do that and all the money that they made from that, then they, it would go to help a local small businesses. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know if everyone did that. I'm that's guessing so cool. other, other, you know, people did as well, but I think around sports, that's becoming something more yeah. common where you can have a version of you there when you can't be there in person and the money goes to good cause. So. That's cool. Yeah. I saw Sean Evans from hot ones, the YouTube show. Oh. He had his own too as well. Very cool. Very cool. So, so yeah, a lot of money. Um, yeah, hold on. We, you said a chair and a light. That don't equal $5,000, well, Sonny. Well, it's not that far off. And then I bought all the stuff for my ceiling rig. Okay. Okay. And I need to spend more. Well, it's not full 5000 yet because I need to get from you all of these arms and clamps that are going to have to go in that. Uh, okay. Because, like, up. you know, like a light. It's like, what, these lights are like 700 800 a pop. Uh, the was, chair is like, what, a thou? Yeah. But, well, so we're like, th- we're like 30 my 300 whole, off. My uh, well, the whole setup for the lights. Oh stuff, yeah, the bars and stuff. Yes. The conduit, yeah. Plus the remote. Um, that that total price ended up being like twelve hundred. Okay. So it added oh, up. Geez. The light was nine. It's like a yeah. two point oh. Yeah. Yeah. Then the, then the clamps and the arms, those kind of sneak up on you. There's, yes. Because you got have quite a, quite a few of them. Yep. All yep. Right. So I got a couple other things in the cart too of, of some audio stuff, um, some extra fill lights that are going to go up as well, which were, you know, just a couple hundred. And nice. Um, it's it's all adding up. And oh, oh I'm gosh. getting a, a new table as well for, for what? The, the flip side of my uh, right behind my desk so I can do a. I There's can nothing do a flip. behind your desk. I know there will be. So you oh so you have like a, like a little you have like a little channel like so you can sit in between them. Okay. Yeah. So is that gonna be there to stay permanently? Um, I'm getting one a nice one that won't won't have to, so I can go move it somewhere else. Okay. I can put it up against a wall. I can do whatever. I'll I'll put it off to the side. I'll put a bunch of shit on it, and I'll never move it back. Okay. That's probably what's gonna happen. Okay. You could put it on wheels, and you could like wheel it around. Oh yeah, but I got that thick carpet. Yeah. I'm kind of okay. So I'm down in the basement. So the the thick carpet is really nice but it's a pain in the ass for actually having anything that's on wheels like, i think for video it's the right choice yeah yeah it, it does absorb it does it does yeah. absorb some sound better, yeah so. big time so yeah um and some other undisclosed purchases that we'll have to unveil at a later date excellent ho, 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 ho. yeah okay i'm yeah. still about 20 grand behind you in total money spent <laughs> i so. don't know oh i, I want... did earmark money for that camera too oh yeah plus yeah, yeah. a lens so yeah. i you know that money's gonna get spent one way or the other yeah i don't want to think about how much money i spent on camera equipment because so. like when i first started doing youtube videos and i was still an engineer like the money i made from youtube was like disposable income I like i needed it for no reason and so I just spent all of it on camera gear endlessly. Yeah. I was like, man, I've always wanted a shoulder rig. I've always wanted a this, a that. I had no need for these things, but I bought them because I've always wanted them. Uh, I wanted them like a macro lens. And so, yeah, um, that, was, that, was, that was a dark time. <laughs> but now that you are doing it full time, you don't have these massive expenses, you know, to kind of keep you moving. You can yeah. just cherry pick when you need something because you've got the... The base need. <laughs> Amber would uh, <laughs> argue that I need nothing, which is probably true, honestly. Right. Um, okay. Oh, yes. The next item in the preamble ramble. When this podcast comes out, John and I will be trekking on a 12 hour journey, an epic journey over to Ohio. We'll be actually coming back when this comes out. We'll be coming back to Minnesota. This, <laughs> this will be launching. So we're recording this a little bit earlier, this podcast, yeah. because. Um, from when you're listening to this, last Thursday, we will have driven 12 hours out to Vinci V's, stopping along the way to pick up one Samson lens, <laughs> and then going to Vince's, and then on Monday, we're trekking back. So when this comes out, you know, we'll be on the road, and I'll be oh, driving, dear. and so you can just put stuff and funny stuff in the comment section of this video, and Scott will be able to read it to me yes. while we're on the road to keep yes. us entertained. Um, I was going to say something. 
Oh, is it is it is it warmer in Ohio than it, it is? is? Okay, is they got a uh, buttload of snow last week though? Because that whole front that went through the East Coast kind of started around Chicago and went went east. Okay, so they're gonna have snow, but it should be warmer. And also, the forecast looks like it's gonna be in like even like the 30s here. Yeah. Ooh. So nice. hopefully everything will be melty melt over in Vinci V's neck of the word. Also, the odds of us leaving a temperature controlled area. This is very unlikely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, we ain't leaving the house. <laughs> yeah. Vince says that everything is either going to be made by Kathy or ordered in. Ordered in. We're not. We're sounds, not going to look at the sun. That sounds for, bad. for four days. <laughs> Dude, screw the sun, man. <laughs> and one final thing on the preamble ramble. So I want to share with everybody. <laughs> I want to share with everyone uh, an advertiser request I got for a channel because you know you get some random people that send you out and say hey we want to do an ad spot or hey you know we're you know can we work together that kind of thing and yeah. i have one that i could not stop laughing and uh and i'm not sharing this to rip on it or that it's a bad product or or anything it's called the clip and rip <laughs> <laughs> that's right you heard it the clip and rip and so if anything I'm giving the clip and clip and rip free ad airtime right now. Yeah, he's not paying me anything. Just because of the name. Just because of the name. And I'm not saying I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this ad spot. But if I do it, it's gonna be with my own creative liberties in mind of how <laughs> I want to advertise for the old clip and rip. It is a paper towel holder. It's got a clamp on it, so you can just man. I'm over here hobbying. I don't know what to do. I gotta get some get some paper towels for my wet palette. Just clamp that thing on there and rip it. <laughs> Clip it and rip it, baby. Man, I see so many infomercial ads <laughs> right is, now. It is made for TV. It is made for TV right there. And he even sent a he sent a picture of the clip and rip in the email. And it looks exactly how you picture it in your brain. It's a mildly more functional paper towel holder. Yes. Okay. But, you know, you got to keep those paper towels on the run, right? You can't just leave them in one spot. I'm going over there. It's going with me. Rip it. <laughs> rip it. Boom. I like that. Yeah. In, yeah. in that same topic of sponsors that have reached out to you that are kind of funny, Manscaped reached out to me. No! <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, dude. <laughs> to do an ad on uh, either the main channel or the podcast. We're still working out the details. Um, but, yeah, that was that was funny. They would send us some some product of course oh yeah we'd have to share it though me oh, first weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah we should grow really terrible facial hair and then and then shave designs on kinda, our face you know i got so, i got a nasty neck beard going you got right it now. going you yeah. got it going so yeah you'd say we're gonna we'll advertise for it and then live on the podcast uh scott will shave everything but the neck <laughs> <laughs> oh that looks so disgusting yeah i'm sure it's what it's what the people want so, all right, so that's it. That's on from the preamble ramble. Johnny boy, what have you painted? I painted. Uh, so it's funny is from the recording of this podcast, the recording of our last episode has only been exactly one week. Yes, one week. Um, so it's going to be more since you guys hear it, obviously. But because we're doing the Vinci V Con, we're trying to organize all of our schedules to make sure we get this done. And I had a big task um, for a upcoming kickstarter that i cannot give you much details on other than it's coming in sometime in april i think when i can share i will share but i had to paint all the stuff for this kickstarter miniatures kind of miniatures war game not a miniature board game but a miniature war game okay which in, which was 12 models and so i am going to do a video on this later but not for like two or three months. All 12 minis? All 12. Well, in one video? In one video. Yeah, I'm just, I got an idea, man. It's going to be a good one. I mean, yeah, I'm sure. It's it. going to be click. I'm baby. sure. Of it. It's going to make you click it. it. I mean, just the fact you painted 12 miles in one video, like with all different schemes, that's clickbait enough. Yeah, that was, that was the rough part. So I painted them in three days, which I gave myself four. My goal was to have them done last night. I had them done Wednesday night. Okay, overachiever. Yeah, uh, it went a little quicker than I thought. And work was a little slower than I thought. <laughs> so I, it's not like I painted them eight hours a day. I probably put in maybe four a day, four hours a day, probably, maybe five. Yeah, you painted each model in one hour? Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Four hours a day, three days, 12 models. Yes, because there is, of the 12, 
five of them without giving too much away are less lesser importance okay okay so there's like seven main highly detailed characters okay um and they with all unique schemes but those other five were kind of related and it was kind of the same base colors so those were a lot faster okay cool but uh yeah i i went with what we're going to talk about in something new we tried i'll share kind of what i did to speed it up and um, it was based off of my riff, off of something I've seen from a recent video by our good, our good buddy, not just Mika. Hey. Yeah, so he has some awesome videos with some awesome content, and he yeah. has got great ideas on things. So I'm like, that's really cool. I'm gonna try to find a way to do that, but faster, okay, and still get a cool end result. Yeah. So, and I use contrast paints as well. Ooh, Ooh man, yeah. just the clickbait just keeps getting laid on. I know. Yeah. Only the only thing I'm missing is the word Warhammer because <laughs> it's not Warhammer. <laughs> it's got everything else covered, but the Warhammer. And then when you go to watch the video, and you be like, "Hey, this isn't exactly what I recognized from the title. It's terrible." Thumbs down. That's how it works. That's what I'm gonna do when I first get to the video. Yeah, 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 yeah. And usually they're like two minutes in. That's the thing that ticks me off. All right, all right. Let's sit down on the couch. <laughs> Sit down on the couch for a it second. It ticks me off when people say, your video claimed a thing from the title and it didn't do a thing. It didn't do that thing. But it's about a story where, where you just got to travel with me for the full 15 minutes. Yeah. And it'll all come together. Okay. And you'll see that I, I like to, as we get towards the last like 30% of a video, kind of wrap everything up in a nice little package and yeah. show how what I thought or what my my expectation was and what's changed and what I took away from it. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do I feel that my initial uh, perception was wrong? Yeah. And people will put these comments in when they've watched the video for four minutes or six minutes and like, bro, you got to go with me. Yeah. If you just went with me, you'd still be mad, <laughs> but you know, at least I'd feel like, you know, my average viewer number time would be up. <laughs> <laughs> I think in general, people asking questions that I answer in the video is something that annoys me. Yeah. So I, I respond very snarkily with a timestamp to the portion of the video that answers their question. Oh, wow. Um, with, with nothing else, just that. It's like, bro, come on. It's there. It's, it's there. there. You just got you to gotta be patient. It's there. It's tough. And you know what? You put a lot of hours into making a video. It feels bad when people are like, I'm mean, like, no, I thought this through. I wrote a script. I had this idea. It's there. It's in there. If you just fucking watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to like it. You don't have to like me. I have no problem with the people that, that are like, um, I had one this week that was like, oh, I had to give it a thumbs down because of the quick cuts and the, and the change in octave in the voice modulation. Because oh, that was really annoying. And I'm like, okay, that's it. You don't have to like my humor. No, yeah. I mean, like people just sometimes just want like the typical vanilla transference of information. They don't want anything, no spice put in. Yeah, I just, I can't, I can't just drink milk. Those guys just eat mashed potatoes without salt in it. Like, I <laughs> guarantee. <it. laughs> just mashed potatoes and milk for and every meal. Dry chicken breast, you know, it's overcooked to like a solid one ninety. You know, <laughs> just ash. Oh. Uh. Yeah, you know, if if that's not fun for no, us, no. I wouldn't make videos if that was the kind of video that I, I had to make. No. It's like, okay, John, you could have one million subscribers, but all your videos have to do this. I'd be like, I after a couple months, I would just be like, I'm a miserable human. <laughs> <laughs> different strokes for different folks. I'm yeah. sure that people out there that do that successfully. Yeah, absolutely. It, and it's all about... What falls best into your personality and what who you are. Yeah. And that as long as you're true to who you are and that's what you like, that's cool. And that will work and you'll resonate with people. When you try to be someone that you're not, you're not going to be happy or people are going to catch on that that's not really you eventually. Yeah. And it's just not going to, it's not going to be a good, not, not goody peepees all around. No, no. Yeah. So. Sometimes you got to figure it out. Like my old videos are very, very clearly different than my my current ones because I was figuring out how to be in front of the camera. Mm. You get to loosen up. Yeah. You, I think you kind of just fell right in. Like you were just right there right away. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I haven't been doing YouTube before, but I've been doing, you know, like performance, stand-up stuff, that kind of it's stuff. Public before, speaking. Public speaking for okay. 30 years. So, Damn. Yeah, since I was in like the seventh grade. So Okay. 
we talked we talked about this before, like Toastmasters and stuff like that. Yeah, dude, yeah. I was and I was I was a Toastmaster guy too. <laughs> I did all that weird stuff. So, but I just like to do it, and so it was easy for me. I think also being getting exposed to it and seeing your channel and being on a little bit on there gave me confidence, and then the podcast too. Just like, look, this is just us being us. Oh yeah, and it resonates with a dozen or so people. <laughs> The Sprudes is Sprudes. It's all 12 of you. <laughs> no, we get more than that. Yeah. We get more than that. Yeah, we have a great community. I love we it. We do. Yeah. We're going to talk in a little bit in the news section. It probably should have went in the uh, uh, preamble ramble section, but I put it in the news section because I couldn't find any other news. No, you should uh, try to like pad it out a little bit. Yeah, we got to <laughs> pad the stats a little bit in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's what I painted, and I can't share it a bunch other than... Um, really cool models i showed you a picture of yeah. one i got some pictures of of all of them if you want to look through them later but they're awesome models yeah you know this is the kind of a game or the kind of a you know kickstarter where it's like the models are not the afterthought the models are equally as important as the rules to the game being a fun game and they're legit awesome so i was super excited to do this so nice. let's hear more what did you paint um I assembled, so yesterday, well, let's back up. Um, similar to you, I have a thing that I can't show a picture of because I want the surprise to be in the video. It's a collaboration with Jazza and ML. It is a, it's a musical chairs inspired idea of sorts. Is there actual music going on? Unfortunately not, but maybe I can make a joke out of that that someone won't appreciate and let yeah. me know in the comment section. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, I convert a model, we all convert a model, and then send our conversions to the other person mm -hmm. so we do like a little rotation and then we paint it and then we do another rotation so eventually what's going to happen is i'm going to convert a model i'm going to paint a different model and then i'm going to base an entirely different model and at the end we'll all have three models that have each phase done by a different person okay and are so you going to mail them back to the original builder or once you do the basing that's the model you get to keep i don't think we discussed that but uh, these are the kinds of information that really needs to be discussed and put in contract yeah well i mean probably not because yours is gonna be the coolest one <laughs> oh, so you want okay. that back only because you like vampires well yes uh so yeah i started on mine i could tell you, i can describe what it is it's a vampire um a mounted vampire on this thing this mount that I can never remember the name of, but you always can. Dreadblade Haro. Dreadblade Haro. Uh, I used its ghostly mount. I used the waist of a black knight. I used the feet of a dark elf, a dark rider, the torso of Manfred. So you can kind of figure out what it looks like based on that. Done some green stuff work so far. Still got to toss on some arms and a head. And I have a fantastic idea for a cape that I can't wait to try out. Do you have a head in mind? Um, yes, I do. Um, it is a head from the Slaves to Darkness kit. Really? Um, yeah. He had horns. I shaved them down, and I'm going to give him fangs. I don't know the best way to do that, whether it's removing material from his teeth that are already there or trying to add the tiniest amount of <laughs> milliput. I don't know, but this is the head I have right now. Let me see this. I could just use a vampire head that I have that has fangs in it already. Um, that'd be fine. Where's the face? Oh, oh damn. I kind of like that face, don't you? That is an awesome vampire face. Yeah, so with fangs, that would crush. His mouth is super open. Um, I just got to figure out the best way to add fangs. Um, and I don't know the best way. I, I think you... I mean, the other option is to take a tiny, just cut little slivers from a sheet of styrene yes. of the shape you want. Because yeah. they're going to be so small. And then just kind of stick those up in his upper lip. Yeah, maybe I'd have to like kind of get rid of a little bit of space there, so there was like a void that they could fit into. Because otherwise they're gonna be like on top of his teeth. You know what I mean? But really, the only bit of his teeth that are showing is just kind of like where his mouth is here, and there's just a line of his front too. So okay. You could stick oh, them right like on, the on side. either side. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll uh, give that a shot before I start removing stuff. This is stuff. an awesome head, dude. Yeah. It had horns. I was like, oh, vampires don't, I don't know. No, I don't think you need the horns. Yeah, vampires can have horns. Uh, you know, I've always been thinking about like a, in, a unique interpretation of vampires. And recently I had Dan over and we were exchanging art books. And he was showing me his Magic the Gathering art book. And they have a whole lore about vampires and how they operate. And I was like, it'd be kind of cool to kind of come up with my own spin on vampires and like, you know, what they can and can't do. Are they night, you know, night people? Do they drink blood? 
I had this idea where vampires could only sire a certain amount of people, like three. So they got to be really picky about who they make vampires and things like that. That's kind of a thing already because like the more you sire, the weaker the, like the bloodline gets. But yeah, we don't need to talk about that right now. Yeah, that's some some deep vampire lore. <laughs> this show about the shit I think about. Um, and aside from that, I assembled some Arco flatulence. Um, <laughs> no, very stinky sisters of battle. No, uh, <clears throat> my kill team. I didn't realize, but I made a very expensive kill team list, like d- dollar wise, because I have sisters of battle. I have Arco Flagellants and I have Sister Repentia. So I need to buy three boxes Ooh. to have all the bits. My excuse was that eventually I hope to have a Sisters of the Battle army. You um, should do that instead of Dark Eldar. Because you want to do Dark Eldar? Oh, Tula, you already invested in Night Lords. <laughs> yeah, I already spent way too much money in Night Lords. So. <laughs> I've, I mean, I do. I've always liked Sisters of Battle. So I, at some point, hopefully I will. Um, but yeah, so I put together these two guys. And then the rest of the time I spent yesterday evening was in a hobby night and i was kind of teaching people how to paint not teaching them how to paint but giving them ideas and how to paint um and so one guy started out doing ultramarines um and i i did i I tried to do the contrast method with him but you know i don't i'm not really well versed in how to use them and on a marine where there's just tons of flat surfaces just seems like it's just really hard to do it's like mechanically difficult without getting like pooling and stuff like that yeah with those coffee stains and stuff yeah so we did we did this with gray sear the light blue undercoat and then we did leviathan blue which is incredibly deep dark blue and now it's kind of splotchy and then from there i was like let's try some dry brushing so we did two stages of dry brushing and that really really cleaned it up with some uh, of the pro acrylic paints yeah um and he he actually was really enjoying himself because it was just like you know dry brushing is kind of effortless and it just really elevated the look of the model um and so he was pretty happy with that and, and they look we'll, good yeah i think we'll move on to paint some other details we'll do some maybe like little i think i like the idea of like some silver chipping um and then i have a towel player that um we we're scheming and then they uh scheming yeah dude we're scheming oh boy and then we were doing uh a harlequin uh friend of mine we're figuring out his scheme too i I had this vision of like a watermelon scheme where you had scarlet (laughs) uh evergreen and like a cream tone like a uh an off-white blue cream tone not cream but off-white blue um that like would kind of look cool like one leg would be the watermelon scarlet one leg would be the green because harlequins are always kind of like vibrant in color right um but it can get overwhelming how yeah. intricate you want to put with patterns. And yeah. I don't think he's going to do stuff. any patterns, um, but he liked the scarlet color that I used for my Blood Knights, the, the two mixture of uh, magenta and red, I think, from Chimera. And so you kind of roll with that. But yeah, speaking of that, this is a perfect segue into our topic. Oh, wow. Look um, what you did there. <laughs> it's like I planned it. Um, basically, uh, John and myself... And probably a lot of you people have friends who are interested in the hobby that you do and they want to learn how to do it. And I was on a podcast recently. Um, I'll link the episode in the show notes below because I can't remember the name at the moment. Um, But one of the podcast uh, hosts who wasn't a miniature painter was like, what's the best way to get into miniature painting? And I was like, holy shit. Like I have no (laughs) idea. Um, There are so many ways to learn and so many different kinds of people that obviously no one answer is right. But I hope in the course of this episode, you and I can bounce back and forth mm-hmm. and discuss maybe like four or five, three or four different like routes that one could take to learn mini painting. Okay. Wow. This is a, this is a heavy topic. Is, that, is it heavy? There's a lot here. There is. And I also want to say too that this isn't just for people that have never painted ever and are interested if you are new to mini painting it's not to say you can't be like oh you could still take some stuff away from this yeah um i often will like to watch videos or read guides on introductory things for either a hobby or a task that i've been doing for a while just to sometimes find this little nugget of refreshment to be like oh you know that's an interesting way to think about that or to do that so yeah all right, we're back after I accidentally unplugged all of the audio. So <laughs> we're going to restart the topic. Scott, you're going to go first. All right. Um, the way that I learned miniature painting, I think I was really, it was a blessing in disguise. And I wish people could do it as well. 
Um, and that that method was just kind of diving in head first. Um, I talked to my local game store employee, which at that time was a Games Workshop employee. He gave me some guidance. Um, I bought some models, went home, tried things, came back, asked him questions. He gave me more suggestions and I went back and did more painting and came back. So it was very hands-on. There were no videos. There were no, there was no, there was no reading. I read no white dwarfs. I just interacted with my local game store and tried things and was just really shameless about it. Um, and that was unintentional shamelessness because I was a kid. And as adults, I have this tendency to really compare what, what, what we're capable of with other people, oftentimes other people that are way further in the hobby than we are. Um, and even to this day, you know, I do that because like, you know, I've been painting for like 15 years. Why can't I paint as good as this person who's been painting less than me? So it's like, you know, a lot of the times people make those comparisons. So the first method that I did that I really liked is just really realizing that what you paint as a beginner is probably going to look bad compared to someone who's been painting for a while. And that's normal. And that's totally fine. And that when you finish painting your first model, I got to say, like, despite you thinking it's going to look bad comparatively, you're still gonna be proud of it. So kind of realizing that and just jumping in head first with like a little bit of advice, kind of forging your own path, learning your own lessons, I think is a great way. One of a great way to learn. So, when I try to dissect this and kind of think about what are, what were the key takeaways that really made that a, a positive experience for you? Um, one, I think it was th the timing of it, right? Yeah. If Scott, little Scott had access to all the Instagram and all the YouTube videos and everything yeah. today, yeah. I think it would be different. I think so. But if we take that out of the equation, because I want to talk about that a little bit more in detail later, but to me, it sounded like the biggest benefit was having, uh, we call it a friend, but but any, somebody in your life that would give you that one-on-one -on -one support in terms of feedback, in terms of encouragement, in yeah. terms of um, keeping you in a positive mindset and wanting to continue. Um, and the nice thing about in today's day and age, that doesn't need to be physically at your, your house. You can just do a Zoom call. You know, and you can get a pretty decent looking uh, picture or take pictures on your phone and then just text them to them and then say, hey, can we chat for 20 minutes tomorrow night and go through this? Yeah. Um, new people really benefit from that, especially when you haven't gone through the first hurdle of even starting yet. Mm -hmm. If you know you have support, it kind of breaks down that barrier a little bit of entry. I think that's a great one. Um, I didn't have that necessarily because I started later when there was not nearly as much as there is today, but it's funny how even in a, a, a few years, how much is out there in terms of resources. So um, what I would recommend if, if you're a new painter or you've not been painting very long is to try to find a balance. And so what I mean by balance is... is education with implementation one thing that seems to be quite common nowadays is people do a lot of the education side or the infotainment side mm -hmm. where you watch a lot of videos that's the main thing or you watch a lot of twitch streams or whatever but then you don't do a whole lot of painting um, I see that more and more. It's like, gosh, I see, these people comment all over the place. These people are on uh, all the Twitch streams. I see them all the time. And then I see a comment of, it's like, oh, yeah, I am I think I might start my second miniature soon. It's like, bro, you've been hanging out with all these people for months. And maybe that's what you want out of it is that community and yeah, that community. engagement and that feeling of connection to something. But I would think that you would feel more engaged and get more out of those things if you just put paint on brush and did it. Um, because like you said, there's so much out there. It's so easy to feel overwhelmed that you're not going to be that good. You're not going to be good enough. Yours is going to look like garbage or whatever. And regardless of the time frame, if this was 1995 or 2025, that's going to be a reality. And you need to understand that I don't mean this in a negative way. It's not just you. 
that's really all of us yeah in our painting journey i mean probably some of the best painters in the world still feel that and that's what drives them to so use that as a drive in a positive way to say it's going to get better it's not going to look great right away but if i don't start and put in the time to do it it's just not going to get better and i'm going to sit here feeling worse about myself six months from now when i haven't gotten any better and my stuff isn't painted anymore either okay so to summarize uh, your idea was a mixture of education and implementation right. which is you watch a thing you then go and try and you experiment yep okay yeah cool i think that's a really a big one yeah now how about, there's too much out there now it's like back in back in your day you just if you wanted to do stuff related to the hobby you 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 had to do the hobby. Like yeah, you couldn't just go and spend like suck suck up all those hours, feeling like you were getting better by watching other people do it. Yeah, and if you could, you your journey might have been different. Who knows what percentage that would have been? But I think that um, watch just enough, read just enough, absorb just enough to get moving. Yeah, to feel like I'm not screwing this whole thing up. Yeah, the question being is how much is just enough, or like what is the just amount of just right amount of content. So that's a little confusing um, for someone yeah. who might not know. Um, okay. Yes, I like that. Um, I remember to kind of backpedal a little bit. I remember uh, basing my models when I was little with big rocks. <laughs> Looked terrible. Uh, and PVA glue. And they glued down. But I noticed they were like flaking off. And they didn't look like the box art. You know how like dirt like oftentimes is like one unified looking thing mm -hmm. and mine was like once i primed my dirt it was like it looked like a bunch of individual rocks and i was like how do you make it like one individual thing and, and how do i make it stop falling off <laughs> and he was like apply another layer of pva glue on top of it and i was like holy shit <laughs> and so i did that and i was like ah it solved my problems <laughs> um all the world's problems are solved i was that was so good that was a great experience all it took was elmer's glue <laughs> exactly or, um, the, or the Citadel brand Elmer's glue. <laughs> oh, eight yeah, bucks that, that's what I bought. <laughs> I, absolutely. Um, so the next thing I want to discuss is should you start painting models with like base coat washing layering? Uh, like kind of like a... I don't want to call it like a simple approach because like layering is it can get really complicated really quickly mm -hmm. if you like think about it um or do you dive into the world of wet blending and glazing all right away i i've heard people just say that like just get into the hard stuff right away because like that's what you're going to be doing most of the time like when you get better anyway so just mm -hmm. start the suffering now sure um and i'm curious I have an opinion. I'm curious what your opinion is. Mm. I guess my, because that that's what that's how I started. Yeah. So I can I can see it from that angle. What I say is, approach it in the way that will get you painting. If it excites you to be like, oh my gosh, look at this video, this crazy thing they did in just so little time, and how much better it looks than somebody else that just did a base coat and then a wash. If that excites you then just shed the fear and do that. Okay. If that is too overwhelming to you, and that's like, I wouldn't even know where to begin, and that becomes the hurdle that stops you from beginning painting, then don't worry about it. Okay. So I think it's based on whoever you are, um, because some people want to jump into that more artistic side, and some people just want to have their models look good and not worry about a thousand bits of information hitting them at all times. There's no way that you can do that and screw yourself up forever is the most important thing to me. If I painted like the GW method of base coat, wash, highlight, or spray paint it all gray sear and then contrast paint, I'm still going to take some things and learn some things that I will apply later if I choose to improve as a painter and try other techniques. Because it, at the end of the day, it's still paint on brush and brush on model and certain aspects, no matter what technique you do will translate. Understanding the consistencies of paints is a big one and how thin or thick I need. And based on how I understand how thin I need for layers, now I can see the difference of how I want it thicker when I want to do wet blending 
and I can see that difference because I've been painting with a thinner paint for all this time, I now can differentiate and now I can understand how it's acting different. If I did that from the very beginning, there's so much information to absorb. I may not catch all that right away because I'm too concerned with, um, you know, just doing it instead of sitting back and reacting to it. Okay. So that's I'm so, mine, which is kind of a throwaway answer because I know what people depends want. Depends on the person, right? Yeah. Is yeah. It's, it's depends on what, what excites you. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I, that's fair. I mean, I think everyone can look in, you know, look inside and determine that for themselves. Mm. Uh, my answer to the question is I would not start doing that. And you kind of touched on the reason why in explaining yours is because there's so much else going on other than just mixing the paint and wet blending that you don't have a grasp on yet. Yeah. You don't have a grasp on how much paint to put in a brush, how to dilute the paint for base coat consistency, how to apply the paint to the model without fucking it up and without continually messing with it and then tearing the paint and making it look awful. Like, there's like how much like n not not to get paint in the for rule like all these things there's so much going on just in base coating for someone who's never applied paint to a miniature before that adding on the increased complexity of wet blending or glazing or feathering or whatever it just seems like it would be a really rough time and like put someone off from painting models as opposed to using an easier method sure I go, you just reminded me of something that we've talked about before on the podcast, but it applies here as well Is a really, a, a quote that stuck with me strongly from Andy Wardle that the most important thing as a miniature painter is knowing how to control your brush and how to apply the paint. It's not about any technique. It's not about knowing any secret or doing any certain thing to achieve a certain result because there's a hundred roads to the same destination in miniature painting. But if you can just put the paint where you want it and have the paint act like the way you want it when you apply it, that will take you wherever you go. And so inundating yourself with all these other techniques instead of just, I'm just not gonna worry about all that stuff. I'm just gonna need to know how thin or thick I should have the paint. How much do I put on the brush? How do I prepare the model? How do I hold it in the right way? How do I get myself right so I can get those fine lines? How can I make sure that I have a smooth coat? Make sure that I don't have any dry spots. Make sure that I it, it's fully opaque where I want it to be. All those kinds of things that that will stick with you forever. And that's something from the very first model you paint, you'll be working towards without even worrying about it. It's mm. just something, if you're not focused on doing this technique correctly, you can just focus on making sure the paint is going where I want it and it's acting the way I want it to act. I feel like Andy Wardle's quote, couldn't you apply that also to like wet blending? Like the most important thing is you just need to know how to apply paint. I mean, just applying paint at its simplest description is just wet blending or any or anything really, right? Right. Yeah, I, I think that having a at least a baseline knowledge of in my head... I want this to happen. And then when I apply the paint with the brush, that result happens. I think that base baseline knowledge will then make any of those other things much easier. Because if I don't really, when I'm new, I don't know exactly what's going to happen once I put my, my brush on here and mix it around. Yeah, I don't really know. So if I'm, if I don't know, and I'm trying a, a d more difficult technique or even something like non-metallic metal or whatever, if I don't know what I want it to look like, how could I possibly make it look that way? Okay. So I think getting your, your basics down, your fundamentals down of controlling the brush and having the, the final product look like in your brain you wanted it to look is, is what's going to help you succeed more at those other techniques. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so now another topic that I hear a lot of beginners um, who are understandably uninformed ask is, like, what should I be painting? Mm. Uh, like, when someone's Good like, one. I want to get into busts, uh, which is not, that's not a beginner. Like, a, a beginner doesn't normally start with, with painting busts. They totally can. There's no reason why they can't. Um, but normally someone who's kind of a little bit further along in their painting journey will ask that question. It's like, what busts should I paint? And it's like, 
which one looks cool to you? Yeah. Um, so this is a, a very common answer about like, what should you paint? And I think obviously the answer we're going to say is whatever's cool to you. But I think I want to investigate why the question is even being asked in the first place. Mm. And my theory is, is because people are looking at this, the hobby of miniature painting, almost like grinding a hero in WoW from 1 to 60. Oh, it's wow. like at 60, the fun starts. 1 through 60, no fun, all work. So what's the most effective and fastest way to get me from 1 to 60? Is it having what's the what's the mini painting equivalent of having a high level dude run me through an instance I shouldn't be in so I can get max experience, you know? <laughs> and it's like you are thinking about this wrong. Right. Right? That's that's a great analogy. Yeah. I just thought of it right now. That's, that's crazy. Why are they wrong, John? That you need to put yourself in the shoes of the player that every time they get a character to 60, they roll a new character <laughs> because the journey was the fun part. Yeah. If you don't enjoy the journey, it would be like you could only level your character to 60 in WoW if you could only get one level a week. <laughs> because if you if you just power through it there is no powering through it because powering no. through it in miniature painting means that level 60 means that you're really really good at all this stuff well you you can't inundate that you can't force that to happen you no. can't put a microchip in your brain and then suddenly you know it yeah um you have to you have to do it over time the good thing is it's already a hobby that requires patience <laughs> it's already a hobby that is slow especially when you're new so trying to force speed on it is just not going to help you. Speed in learning a thing and speed in actually completing a model will come with time. And that time is because you put in the reps to do it. So um, I, I think that that's absolutely applicable. And a lot of times in life, and this is no knock on anybody, we want to get to the, the good part. We want to get yeah, to the part. The end game. Yeah. It could be anything, right? It's like, I want to get to a part in my life where I can buy a mansion. Let's just fast forward to that part. <laughs> I don't want to be broke and eating ramen every day. <laughs> you know, everyone likes this great rags to riches story. And they're like, oh, man, look at that. God, Elon Musk has got like $20 billion. He probably has more than that. <laughs> but um, probably, probably not. That's a lot of money. $20 billion? Yeah, I think he overtook uh, Bezos in net worth. How much well, how much money does Bezos have? I thought he was worth like three hundred billion. What the fuck? Yeah, dude. And so, this motherfucker is cutting my commission wages on Amazon affiliates. Yeah. Oh, well, not anymore. He stepped down as CEO. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll get it back then, right? Sure. 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 Yeah. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 We're just gonna keep cutting that percentage down. All right, different story. Different story. Yeah. Uh, um. They want that rags to riches story. They want that slum dog millionaire story, mm. right? You know where it, it? Yeah. It's all great and all at the end. But you know what? He had to jump down into the into the poop pit. You remember that scene? Yeah. He had to jump in the poop pit. You gotta jump in some poop pits, people. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't so okay. Yeah. I think in a lot of ways in life, I love how you answer the question in a way that I didn't anticipate you to answer it. Um, which is totally fine. I think uh video games have taught me that all the fun happens at the end and that there is an end, but there is no end. No. Right. So the best painter in the world is not level 60 and doing all the fun things. There is no max level. Yeah. It, it, it is infinite. You will always learn and you will always feel like you could be doing more and learning more. And maybe that someone else is possibly better than you. Well, it's like, I mean, he is level 60 or she is level 60. But as soon as they ding 60, a new expansion drops immediately and raises the level <laughs> cap to 70. So right. that, that's the changing in style and methodology, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, now no one's into Goblin Green. Okay, we're moving on to something else. Matte paint now. Okay, yeah. now I was in the highlighting. Okay, whatever. Yeah. It's, it's the, the goalpost is always moving. <laughs> yeah. You get closer, it just keeps pushing further and further away. And so you need to understand that to know that you you can't be focused on the the destination you need to know that there really is no no end game right there really is just it keeps moving i need to enjoy it 
and be inspired by it and by others and keep trying because if I just do this for the end game, I will burn out and quit. Yes. Because I will realize that at some point you will realize that doesn't exist. Yeah. Like this is the this is the hobby. Welcome to it. If you don't like it, it's not for you. Or you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you're doing it wrong. So it so it's about the journey. It's yeah. not about the destination. A very classic quote. Um, and this reminds me, I was watching a video from a, a lovely new YouTuber I discovered called 52 Miniatures, and he, he had a little rant video that I listened to a couple minutes of, and it's like, why do people complain about and badger people about speed of painting and time it takes to paint in a hobby where everything is slow and methodical and patience is a requirement. I got so much shit for how long it took me to paint my blood nights. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it's all in good fun. Um, but like it, that represents a very real thing about the hobby. People are trying to like really push the gas pedal and really get through the process, but it's just like, slow down, calm down. This is about being slow and methodical and enjoying the process, not necessarily the end result. And that is a problem that I've had to teach myself because I've always told myself that I love the end result of a model. So I'm trying to get there as fast as I can. And I'm suffering in the meantime, but I'm really coming around to the idea that like, I just need to like get in the zone and just like enjoy applying paint on a miniature. So maybe that's part, partially my fault. Let's bring this back to world of Warcraft. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, yes, I agree. <laughs> so it's like, if you got to the max level and the game had no raids. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so you finish a model, and that feels good. It feels like you accomplished something. Yeah. But the model's done now. I can't go on a raid with this model and get more new elite gear. It's done. So whether it took me a week or a year to get to that level 60, it still is put it on the shelf and I'm done with it. And that's okay. And so... We think sometimes that speed is the answer because a lot of us are doing this for an alternative um, kind of result, and that is to get our stuff painted so we can play a game. Guess what, Scott? You've been playing those Blood Knights and that whole vampire army, and they weren't all painted. Did you have less fun in the game because they weren't all painted? It's hard to know because I don't ha I didn't I can't compare. Yeah. But I still had fun. When we played the last time we had Tendicon, that was the first time I had ever played <laughs> Who the a game. Fuck named it that. <laughs> uh, it was the first time I had ever played a game with a fully painted Age of Sigmar army. Yeah. And it oh did. yeah, you know. Yeah. I don't recall feeling anything cool about that. It was cool, but it wasn't like this. Like. Oh, I've reached the promised land. The I know. The veil peels back. God reaches down and yeah. just touches you. Yeah. Touches me and each of my skeletons. <laughs> <laughs> it, Dude. It, it was cool. It Don't get me wrong. It was cool. The only moment it was super cool was when we had all our armies on the table and everything was painted except for a couple of Scotty's things. Yeah. But really, you stood six feet back and you're like, that's a cool looking table right there, boys. Yeah. And then as soon as the dice start rolling, I'm like, fuck this. We need to win. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a shit. I will eat, I will eat my painted model. That means we can win today. Because <laughs> it was then it was down to the tactics and it was down to, you know, armies clashing and bodies flailing and stormcast getting their fake heads ripped off. Uh, yes. That was what it was about. Yeah. And so it's cool, but it's not it's don't let that be your the carrot that you constantly drive towards in thinking that the hobby side is just an unfortunate side effect of getting to that goal. Mm. If you embrace the hobby side, you'll suddenly start to shed all those kind of the, the weight on your back of needing the whole army painted. And it'll happen. It'll happen when it happens. And speed painting has a place. Absolutely, you yeah. Know, it's absolutely fun. You know, when I did that Necromancer on on the stream in a couple hours and we cranked that out and that felt good because it's like, ah, you get that little endorphin rush of, you know, we went through it quick and we got a cool final thing. I'm not going to paint every one of my models like that. I'm yeah. not going to paint like maybe one in 10 like that. But it's it's a fun change of pace. And I think that's an important thing with miniature painting as well, as you get going and you get your legs under you and you painted a couple of models and you're feeling a little bit of comfort, 
then you could start to experiment where it feels, you know, it's slightly out of your comfort zone. And that might be painting something super fast. I might be trying my really, really hardest on this banner. That could be, you know, I'm going to try to make my basing even cooler, whatever you want to do. But if it's not fun on a kind of hour by hour basis, it's going to, you're going to kind of fall eventually. Um, and that doesn't mean that all portions of painting a model need to be fun because it's not. Yeah. You know, and, and you need to realize that too. It's not always going to be fun. It's going to be frustrating. You'd be like, gosh, this looks like crap, but that's okay. That's okay. It'll look good in the end. Yeah. And you'll be happy with it. Um, you talked about what to paint. Yeah. That's, that's such a common thing. Okay. And I was thinking about this on the drive up today. Um, if you're getting into this, this hobby, Usually you get into this hobby because, not usually, but oftentimes, you get into this hobby because you have this this bigger goal, right? It could be, I'm starting Warhammer 40K. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to be playing Tau. What should I start painting with? Um, my recommendation is you don't start with your Tau right away. Because that's got a whole bunch of extra baggage associated with it. Because every model I paint now has to live in my 2,000 point army. And that's a lot of pressure. That means that first one has got to look, it's got to look as good as the last one. Otherwise, it's gonna all going to look terrible. No, disagree. It's not true. Keep going. It's okay, not true. Okay, 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 fine. But it's an unnecessary hurdle we put in front of ourselves okay. that stops us from starting. So, okay, yeah. You're saying people's inaccurate fear is going to stop them from painting and that they should indulge themselves so that they can eventually paint their tile they want to paint yeah and okay. not very far out in the future so okay. what you're going to do is you, you're going to you're going to start pushing that starting line further and further away you know so i'll start my tile and i'll start my tile in. no you start off by saying okay i'm going to paint three models that aren't related to my tile army but i really think they're cool models i'm going to paint those three models because if they're a model that you think is cool you're going to have more fun painting them and then after those three, I'm starting my Tau. Set yourself those limits and say, that's where I'm going to go. As long as those Tau excite me. And now I've learned how thin the paint should be. Now I know basics of how I want to do the colors. Now I know the basics of, of you know, how it's going to look in the end. Now just do it. Yeah. If you try to start with the Tau, many of us, uh, myself included, when I started and I got into Age of Sigmar and immediately started buying skeletons and stuff, I was like, oh, gosh. I need these skeletons to all look the same. I need them all to be equally good and all this stuff. And so I just kept pushing them off. But if you start with something else and then give yourself that that deadline to start. And it could be a box game too. A lot of people are like, get into this because of Zombicide or something else like that. Yeah. Um, in, in that case, like, bro, you got like 800 zombies to paint. Just paint whichever one you want to start. You'll get those zombies down soon enough. But Yeah, but how is that any different than your skeletons? It's not really. Okay. It's not other than the fact that I I envision my army. They're all on the table together, and they all should kind of be whatever. I got my heroes for Zombicide. I'm going to wait till I'm a little bit better. But there's, like okay. I said, 100 zombies in that box. There's never 100 zombies on the table at once in Zombicide, as far as I know. Sure. If, and if I just practice and are not super great with those, I'll, I'll get better. In the meantime, I'll have some painted things on the, on the table. Okay. If, okay. That's an over, if that's overwhelming for you as well, then... Buy a couple of Reaper Bones minis and start. And okay. just paint a couple things. It's like, okay, I get how this paint works. I get how my brush works. I get how I need to wick it off on the paper towel first so the brush isn't like fat or as soon as it touches the model, it just goes everywhere. Right. Those those initial fumbles we have. I'm gonna half disagree with you. Okay, that's allowed. You meant you made a comment that or you were like you were like interpreting what someone might be thinking. Where if I paint this model, it needs to live in my army. It absolutely does not need to, right? Sure. You buy a box of Tile Fire Warriors. You get a kill team box. Comes with a kill team squad. You paint the the squad, and you're like, I don't like this. It's, that it doesn't need to live in your army. That can just go on your shelf. Can go in your carrying case, and then you can paint your future dudes in a different way. Um, I did. I've done this thing where I've like try to develop a paint scheme for an army by painting three models consecutively and then modifying the, the the scheme each time to develop a final scheme for an entire army. And that's been very rewarding for me. Um, and those models 
I don't care. So they would live in my army mm. uh, because they look close enough uh, yeah, where do. no one would be able to tell. Um, so yeah, so I don't think if you paint a model and you're not satisfied with it, it doesn't need to stay in your army. Um, it can be repainted. Um, if you want to strip it, you can do that. You don't need to do that. Um, but also what you mentioned that I agree with is that fear. I don't think it's necessarily true. Um, I think if you were to paint some Tau fire warriors, cause you were excited about painting Tau and it didn't look that great. Um, you'd still be happy with them in an army at the end. And, yeah. and the thing is that as you paint, you improve constantly and so it's almost impossible to have an army that is identical in, in skill because you're always getting better the more you paint, especially when you paint like a character like really well. It's like you learn so much that you almost wish you could go back and repaint it. But I mean, I never do that. I always just like apply what I learned to the next character that I painted. Right. Um, so yeah, I think if you, if you have that fear where it's like, I want everyone to look the same. It's a fallacious fear because like it's impossible to to be consistent in quality unless you are intentionally painting worse than you are capable of. Um, and I don't mean for the sake of speed. I mean for the sake of maintaining consistency. It's just not something people do. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. That they're, it's If you're worried that they're all going to look different, guess what? No matter what you do, they're all going to look different. Yeah. The, um, the, expect, the, the exception to that is what I did my Paint My Army in a Weekend video. Mm-hmm. I purposely set out my exact steps and yeah. none of those steps were set up for skill to be involved in. Sure. Does that make any sense? Um, it's like, we, yeah, we all base, they all get base coated. They all get dry brushed. They all get washed. They all get whatever. Like if you do it in a very short period of time and you make a, make it systematic. Yeah. Then it's achievable. I tell you what, no decisions. I did not have any fun doing that. <laughs> that was not fun. That was the only fun part of that was at the very end that I had an army painted. That <laughs> felt cool. Really? But I mean, that's just boring to me. And some people, if it's about getting a cool looking army done, it doesn't have to be fun for them. But for most of us, I mean, you're probably listening to this podcast because you care about the painting side in some regard. And yeah. even if it's, 80% 80% gaming, 20% painting. That's 20%. You still want it to look cool and and you're going to get better. You're not going to get better as a painter if you follow what I did in that video. It's just boom 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 boom. Boom you'll, boom boom boom. Yeah, you'll plateau, I think. Right? Yeah. You'll learn something and then you'll be like this is what I'm going to do forever. And then, you know, it just yeah. happens. Which isn't to say like learning what you did in that video is a bad thing. No, it's it, it has its place, but it, its place is not really to get you much better as a painter. Okay. It's it's places to show you how steps work when done in an assembly line method that will get you where you where you want to go. Um, and then obviously doing your test model first to make sure I know what my steps are and I know what the final looks going to be. But that model, doing the test model was fun because I wasn't following steps. I was like, this is what I think will be yeah. cool. This is what I think will be efficient to have an impact and not a lot of steps to do it. Yeah, you're like so, doing like your R and D like in the beginning. Yeah, that was fun, and yeah. then seeing how replicating that R and D at the end worked was very satisfying as well. So okay, so to reiterate, um, John acknowledges the fact that beginners are terrified of the idea of having an inconsistent looking army, however untrue that fear may be, and he says to deal with that. Um, consider painting a different models that maybe won't end up in your army. Um, or sorry, maybe from a different faction. Even I painted, I painted Queek Headtaker one time, and I hate Skaven, but I love that model because it was just fun. Mm. And so, in doing that, you can kind of, you know, you can kind of cut your teeth on like different models, and then you can go and paint uh, the other dudes and have have more success. And in my opinion, I think um, just diving right into the Tau uh, also works, and just acknowledging the fact that you're still going to like the end result when they're all together in an army, despite it looking a little bit worse um, and just kind of going for it. I don't think there's one answer that's wrong. No, I don't. I don't think there is. I think one thing I wanted to really quick mention is that when you talked about just paint that box of fire warriors, um, there is an aspect to this hobby that gets us the more the, the, sooner we are in our journey so the closer we are to the beginning of our journey and at some point it fades in some regard and that is the price 
So if it cost me fifty dollars, oh yeah, for that box of okay. Fire Warriors, <laughs> and I'm brand new, the weight of screwing them up is heavier because yeah. it's like that's fifty bucks, and I'm gonna screw them all up and whatever. And eventually, a year from now or two years from now, it's like, yeah, I'll buy a couple of boxes, whatever. Yeah. And, <laughs> and even if and, and, and even if money is still, you know, it's like I only have so many hobby dollars, I want to make sure that I stretch them. Um, it's a it's it is so hard if you put a little bit of of effort in it's so hard to run out of models to paint even on a very limited budget you know you could trade you can find local deals you can you know get stuff on eBay and rescue it you can um you know you can buy cheap models like the Reaper Bone stuff for 3 bucks and stuff like you can that's the great thing is you can spend as much time as you need if you're running out of models and don't have the money to paint them and say, I'm just going to go slower because I only have five more models left. I'm not going to be able to buy any more models till next month. And then guess what? Because you took your time as you were just trying to eke out those extra models, you'll become a better painter because you took a little bit more time on them. Um, but it's absolutely true is, is a roadblock we put up, especially when we're newer or especially when we're starting a new game or something is the dollar factor. Definitely. And, and letting that affect my painting. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to do. Yeah. But try to remove the money you spent from the painting table. Yeah. If you remove oh, yourself cool. from that. That's a cool quote. I like yeah. that. Yeah, somebody, somebody write that down. Put that on a shirt. <laughs> Put that on a shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll forget the quote anyway. But yeah, it, it you will you'll have so much more fun. You'll grow faster. You will just have a more enjoyable experience and be more proud at the end if you just don't worry about the money when you're painting. Worry about it later. Worry about it when you got to figure out what you're going to buy next. When you can buy something next if you can afford to buy something next. Worry about that then. But this is getting into the the more artistic, creative side. The more we can free our mind of the burdens and let creativity go the more fun we're going to have and the more invested we're going to be and the better product's going to be. So just be an artist, even if you don't think that you are when you sit down in that chair. Yeah. I think it, to help you remove the money from the painting table, really nothing you're doing with paint is destructive. Yeah. This is an entirely non-destructive hobby, unless you are obviously converting and clipping things up and things like that. But as a beginner, I doubt you're going to be doing that anyways. Um, so like if you paint something and it was expensive and you're like shit this sucks, which I, I, I have I don't think that happens a lot. Maybe it does if you're like you know, you're a glass half half, half empty kind of person. You can always remove the paint and just restart, and then like your your money is preserved. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I liked my opinion on that, and I I want to spread this throughout the multiverse like a disease. Is always tell yourself you can do it. But don't buy the stuff to do it. Because if you don't buy the stuff to do it, you say, I could do that. Because I bought Simple Green. Simple Green sucks balls because whatever the new recipe. Yeah. And I know there's other stuff like Purple Power or whatever. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Super I tell clean. myself I can do it. Yeah. But if I have to go that extra step to then go and buy it or find out where it's available or whatever, I'm just going to say, I still did something cool. I still have this painted model and I can put it on my shelf and I can learn from it. And I'm not, it's going to go back and I'll put it next to the one I paint four models later. And I'm going to see how much better I got. There's a lot of value in that. So if I put a little roadblock in front of myself, say I can do it. I'm not ruining anything. I can repaint this at any time, but I don't just have it at arm's reach to just keep dunking stuff in after ever I paint them. Yeah. Then I end up not doing it. That's true. Yeah. And, and I just, I'm fine with that. And yeah. if you strip your models or, or like if you buy some terribly painted stuff online, uh, you know, on eBay, and then you want to strip them, that's awesome. Do that. Yeah. It's not your paint job. It's not your paint job. Some crappy dude's paint job. That yeah. guy. Yeah. That guy sucks. He sucks. <laughs> Hope he didn't use enamels, <laughs> like testers enamels on it. Uh, yeah. Otherwise enamels, you're enamels on plastic. Yeah. You're kind of screwed. You're, um, you're well, you're not screwed. Paint. Like there's, there's like these weird ways to strip paint um, that I don't know what they are. Like, there's like this, uh, people in like England use like this, like an oil that's like for vehicles. I forget what it's called. Oh, that's right. It's like dot or I don't know what it's called, but like, it's apparently pretty effective, but it's just like hard to discard the oil after the fact. I thought it was, it was, it's something for your car engine for lubrication or whatever. Something yeah. In there. Yeah. I've seen that too, but it's just like, but don't ever touch it. Cause it'll melt your skin off. It's like, okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> super super toxic, and you can't throw it away. You can't do anything risky. with it. But, 
but yeah, that's that's my thought. We're not the we're not the stripping experts though. There's a product for you, a stripping medium that actually works on plastic models in a way that's not super pain in the ass. I know it exists. I know it, it I've used it. It's shit. <laughs> I, I know there's miniature painting branded stripping stuff, and it sucks. Okay, I'm sorry. It sucks. I want everything to work like acetone works on pewter models. Yeah, that is amazing. If it doesn't work like that, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the the biggest problem is, is acrylic paint is basically plastic, mm. and the model is basically plastic. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. So if it's going to get rid of the plastic paint, it's also going to get rid of the plastic model. All right, organic chemists, I want you to find the difference between plastic miniatures and acrylic paint, and find the chemical that dissolves one, yeah. not the other. Goobs. Do it, Goobs. Figure it out. You've been put on this planet for one purpose. Stripping it, paint. It is this. Stripping. Just stripping, actually. Show me them biceps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else you want to add for people who are beginners and listening to this uh, and wanting to learn? Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> uh, just paint the damn models. Paint more minis. Mm. Yeah, there's uh, the podcast uh, Legends of the Painty Men, and uh, they've got a sign off at the end of their podcast episodes that says, "Don't be a dick, paint your shit." <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really appropriate right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, out of the news, we got news. Um, I'll just yeah. kick us off here. You do it. Uh, cool money or not, just teased the release of yet another. Zombicide, because if there's one thing I needed in my hobby, it was another Zombicide game. Yeah. And this one is a Western one. Western? Yes. Um, so I, I it, saw right? this the, the little intro video for yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't know it was Zombicide before I watched the intro video. And I just saw it was a CMON Kickstarter coming. So I'm like, I'll watch this, whatever. And I was like, oh, it's like an old timey Western thing. This is going to be like that Red Dead Revolver of video of board Wild games, West whatever. Exodus, kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. And then it was like, Pow! bullet shoots to the sky, and then it's like, what the heck? It's shooting at something in the in the in the background there, and it zooms in. Oh, it's a zombie head. I'm like, oh, you got me. <laughs> I've been bamboozled. Yeah. Uh, zombicide, undead or alive? Won't it? Uh, <laughs> what is your take on Zombicide? I've only played it. I've uh, I played regular Zombicide the, way back in the day when it was new, probably two or three times. Thought it was cool because that was kind of the first miniatures board game I had ever experienced, mm -hmm. you know, kind of as an adult. It was okay. Um, and then I played Zombicide Black Plague a couple times because um, I had a buddy that kickstarted it. And that was when I was very new into miniature painting. And I was just, I didn't even care about the game because all the little extra hero figures that it came with, I was just looking at the models. Yeah, dude. It's okay. Yeah, that's it's a three out of five. Like it's okay. Yep. I don't know why they. <laughs> I guess because it has a following now, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I was just gonna say something really mean. I don't want to be mean. <laughs> People at Simon are really nice. Um, and if it sells, like who cares? Keep making it, right? But it's okay. I've played the fantasy one that you mentioned. What's it called Black Plague? I played the original one as well. Um, and yeah, it's like a dungeon crawly. Get gear, have fun. I don't know. It's nothing to survive. Yeah, survive. They keep spawning, coming yeah. at you. I guess I probably should play it more to have a really concrete opinion on it. But yeah, it's not like like Blood Rage, for instance, is another Simon game that I really like, and it's I think it's way better than Zombicide um, in terms of like mechanics and stuff like that, and the model quality is the same because it's the same company. Um, but yeah, for I guess Zombicide was the first one, probably. Yeah, I think it was their their first big hit if i recall yeah the first zombicide and notably their more recent games are more complex and the actual game systems are a little bit more involved mm -hmm. um i think it's made to be a more beer and pretzels there's some cool stuff and oh my gosh we found the fire axe yeah. you know and yeah yeah, like, yeah. Kuh, kuh. <laughs> <laughs> you know and so it's it's meant to have just enough com complexity to make it feel cool but it's to me, it just kind of got boring after a while because you end up doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, that's my same same opinion. Yes. So that's that's a bit of newsy news. Another bit of newsy news is we've got another reveal from the Warhammer Quest, which is an elf. <laughs> Not just any elf, John. She is a Kurnothi exile. 
Her name is something ridiculous with a Q. <laughs> okay. Quilas or something. I don't know. Quifa. <laughs> It's way too many consonants, whatever it is. Um, it's a wood elf. But no, notably, yes, Vince noted that it was she was called a Carnothi. And she is missing something. Missing? She's missing. Her family. Who <laughs> <laughs> will bring the together <laughs> today. Uh, she's got no hooves. She's in a satyr. She's a normal person. She's got antlers. I don't know if they're like like in her head or like they're like a crown or like something no, they're they're in her head they're, they're in her head i there's don't a, mind there's it. a picture we can see back behind her oh yeah head too and there's there's no there's like, no band no band okay i don't mind it it's a sick model she's got the classic fadeaway jumper holding the bow point like like a uh, posture Pew. i like it i'm into it don't some of the what else have horns or is it just the the dude like the leader dude uh, oh, you mean of the Kurnothi? Not Kurnothi, the actual wood elves. Actual wood elves? So some wood elves have horns, yeah, but they're not coming out of their heads. Orion. Oh, yeah, Orion. Orion has horns coming out of his head, but he has like the hooves and stuff. Oh. Um, but the other elves have like crowns and, and yeah, like you know, it's like animals that they've killed and they've made like, you know, tchotchkes out of. Tchotchkes. I couldn't think of a better word. So yeah, she is Kurnathi and in the story it said that or like her family or village or whatever was all massacred and so that's why she's an ex, she's an exile and she's going to seek revenge on those that caused those deaths. So she is Kurnothi, Kurnathi. Um, I just want her to take her take her boots off and you see that there's actually hooves on there. <laughs> yeah hey, there can be hooves on all of them as long as you just put boots on so you can't tell there you go <laughs> she doesn't have the backward knees that like horses yeah and deer have so that's yeah, a big are. that's a big thing yeah but she's very cool and i'm sure a million people sent you that picture as well i did uh they did i mean um yes there she's an exile she couldn't defend her home from undead so her and her whole tribe had to move somewhere else She's from Garan, the realm of life. Perfect. Mm -hmm. But that implies, though, that there is a tribe that presumably looks like her um, that still exists somewhere, but they just moved somewhere else because they couldn't defend their homeland. But she was a little bit more salty. And she's like, fuck this shit. I'm going to kill me some undead. I Anyways, guess. like I said in my Instagram story, it's the year of Scott. Yeah. We got vampires and what else, baby? So much money is going to be spent. Dude, someone at GW is like vying for me. I just feel it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like a year ago when all this conversation started, they're like, all right, we need to get this in the timeline of what we're going to release. <laughs> we need to make this guy happy. No. In 18 months, we will make him happy. So yeah, that felt really good to see that. I'm excited about that. Definitely. If I wasn't buying that thing before, which I a thousand percent was, I am definitely buying it now. Um, it's It's got a wood elf in it and fucking vampires. Like, come on, bro. It's built for me. And those sweet skeleton those guards. Skeletons, yeah. Those skeletons are sick. Yeah. That witch hunter is sick. Oh, uh, it's all it's, it's, it's all coming up. Fucking millhouse. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> though, they're going to like unveil the derpy looking dwarf with a machine gun thing. And I'm just going to be like, uh, okay, we're going to keep that guy in the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's a carriage and overlord kind of thing. Um, yeah, you can see from the silhouette. Oh, I haven't seen that. Okay. It looked like he had like a shotgun and he's short and fat. So okay. Was, like, Okay, we got to do this, don't we? Okay, <laughs> let's do it. All right, what else has we got for news? We got uh, some non-news. One, uh, one final thing. Um, so, as our Facebook group trapped under fast, trapped under fasting, <laughs> the Facebook group, <laughs> the Facebook group that's for fasting, <laughs> is is closing in on seven thousand members. What the heck? Yeah, um, I've started. I, I held a. Um, a kind of a meeting of the of the minds with the other ring bearers, <laughs> <laughs> which is just Josh and Blair, uh, our two buddies that are moderators, about uh, things that are, are changing a little bit in the Facebook group. One, when you get a Facebook group of that size, sometimes things get a little bit squirrely. That's okay. Most of the time, things are great. People are good. But this thing that I'm seeing more lately is because now the group is of a certain size. Tons of people are asking to join that have no idea what the podcast is. Yeah. And that's okay. Definitely. That's okay. Um, but it leads to some odd situations where people post a picture of their tendies on their mini painting desk. And they're like, we're going to sit down for, for building and painting night with my, with my canes. And people are responding like, why are you posting this in a miniature painting group? <laughs> 
That's and then, perfect. And then things kind of sometimes, you know, sometimes people are nice and they correct them. You're like, hey, it's from the podcast, or I, or like, I don't want to see one million attendees post a day. It's like, okay, I there's do. not that many, but <laughs> you know. And so I think what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the uh, the question to join the group. Okay. And we want it to still be overly, uh, extremely inclusive. But something along the lines of this is a miniature hobby focused Facebook group um, spawning off of the Trapped Under Plastic podcast. Yeah. If you understand that, type tendies in the comments below. So you don't have to like write an answer, but you just need to confirm to me that you read this one sentence and understand mm -hmm. that. And I don't know exactly how I want to word it, but that it's not just like the Facebook group titled you know miniature hobby painting there there's going to be other things in there we want there to be sometimes in the episodes we will say hey you know go out to the facebook group and let us know what you think on this topic or let us know what, what your you know nemesis is yes. miniature painting okay and so if someone that didn't listen to the podcast they could still follow that they might not immediately understand what's going on there but they still will feel that um it still kind of relates <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to share that with all you goody peepees out there. <laughs> and now everyone's going to put goody peepees in the Facebook group. And everyone's going to be like, what does that mean? <laughs> Show me your models. <laughs> <laughs> I only want to see minis. I want to see minis. There's a lot of groups out there for just minis. If you don't want random goody peepee and tendies posts, you don't have to be there. No. We're not holding you at gunpoint to be a part of this group. But thank you all, you Spruits and Spruits, that are a lot of awesome stuff. I always like looking through there and uh, posting memes and responses to people's stuff. <laughs> yeah, and it's great. Yeah, gifts and shit, yeah. It's great. Okay, that's all of we got for the Newsy News. All right, welcome to the end of the podcast. Ah! Thank we're, you for listening. We're back to the end of the podcast. <laughs> oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> you can do that if you want to. Ah, yes. The end of the podcast where I say the things. These are the things that are said at the end of the podcast. Mm, quite. Indubitably. Ah, oh, you got me to do it. Fuck. <laughs> so, if you're liking the podcast, <laughs> <laughs> there are many ways you can support the podcast, and they are as follows. Uh, you can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. You did it. Step one. Check. Uh, you could consider watching it with ads enabled. There are Google Chrome extensions that enable you to, to watch uh, the YouTube channel of your choice with ads on. We play three ads a video, and that helps us out. Uh, you can uh, tell your nerd friends about us um, and about our podcast and how amazing and great it is and how it's five out of five. Five out of five. Easy. Uh, or also you can support us on Patreon where we have a bunch of fun things like an extended episode of the podcast where we chat about things like uh, the favorite mini that we've seen from someone else in the in the mini painting community. I said that so poorly. Um, we talk about new things that we've tried and experimented with in the hobby, and also we give feedback to one of our patrons. So obviously, as a patron, you can submit models for us to give feedback for live on an episode, and you can also submit topics for us to discuss in an episode. This episode was brought to you by Scott's brain, the brain of Scott, which is probably why it's. A dangerous episode. Yeah, very dangerous. <laughs> um, otherwise, you can give us a review on iTunes or uh, Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, if you like the podcast, if you like it, if you don't like it, fuck off. Oh, uh, no, just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, how else can they support us? Uh, you can buy a shirty shirt. Merch. Yeah, we're not wearing any today, but trust us, they do exist. <laughs> you can the find that all linked below in the show notes. Anything else, John? <laughs> My brain is <laughs> not working. Thank you all once again, all you goody peepees. <laughs> and until the next episode, we will catch you on the Flippity Flop.